Good evening and thank you for joining us. We begin tonight in the Ukraine, where the much feared full-scale Russian military invasion is now underway. Ukraine's president has declared martial law, calling on world leaders to stop Russian aggression. Joy Malvin has more from Washington. Peace was shattered in the night explosions heard in Ukraine's capital. Airstrikes and shelling hitting cities. This morning, a full-scale invasion is underway. Russian military vehicles and tanks rolling into Ukraine, striking from Belarus in the north, Russia in the east, and the annexed Crimea in the south. People trying to flee the capital and cities, stocking up on gas and cash, not knowing where it might be safe. This woman says, where will I run? Where do I go? Tell me, please. Others sheltered in subways, confused and scared, like scenes from the Blitz during the Second World War. World leaders condemning Russia's move as barbaric, reckless, putting countless lives at risk. President Putin of Russia has unleashed war in our European continent. This is a brutal act of war. Our thoughts are with the brave people of Ukraine. But Ukraine is not part of NATO, the military alliance, and so its president calling on Ukrainians to take up arms and defend their country. Vladimir Putin warning any nation that dare interfere with his plan will face consequences they have never seen. Russian violence, aggression, and violation of international law will not go unpunished. Canada, the U.S., and Western allies inflicting more biting sanctions to cripple Russia's economy, cutting off banks, billionaires, and technology imports. Putin is the aggressor. Putin chose this war. And now he and his country will bear the consequences. But will economic pain be enough to stop Putin? President Biden made clear U.S. troops inside Ukraine is not on the table, and he has no plans to talk to Putin. Joy Melvin, CTV News, Washington. An associate professor at Lakehead University who has significant understanding of the history leading up to the conflict warns that Russian threat could continue westward. Stephen Jobbit works in LU's History and Northern Studies Department. He has a degree in East Central European History from the University of Toronto and lived in that part of the world for several years. Jobbit says tensions have been growing for decades, but Russia has become even more aggressive to combat what it considers to be Western influence. Since about 2014, the Russians have been sort of upping the ante in the region by uh, uh, pushing back against Ukraine's leaning towards the West and, and more importantly, the European Union and NATO looking to expand into that region. So it's not just Ukraine, but you know, Poland and Hungary, Czech, the Czech Republic, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. While many countries have already placed sanctions on Russia, Jobbit believes many more are needed to have any real effect. We'll have much more on the crisis in Ukraine later on in the news hour. Ontario's NDP has accused Doug Ford's government of secretly lowering the Canadian content policy for transit vehicles. That could pose major problems for Thunder Bay's Alstom plant, and the official opposition is laying the blame for looming layoffs there directly at the government's feet. Vasilios Bellows reports. The production of transportation vehicles in Thunder Bay may be impacted if what the NDPs are claiming is true. They have stated Ford's Conservatives has lowered the Canadian content minimum from 25% to 10% for transit vehicles procured with provincial funding meaning less incentive for production of things like rail cars in the province. Thunder Bay Atacoke and MPP Judith Monteith Farrell stated this would cause even more issues at the Alstom plant after recent layoffs, something she believes has been a pattern of the Ford government. We did everything we could, but it was the decisions of this government to drag their feet about you know, mass uh, transit decisions that we knew we knew these contracts existed. We knew the refurbishing um, uh, needs were there already, yet they dragged it out. And now this has caused this, you know, this lull and this layoff. And, you know, I'm hopeful we don't lose those families, those workers. Premier Ford harshly denied the NDP accusation, saying that his party has always done what they can to ensure the best for Thunder Bay's Alstom plant. The facts are, if it wasn't for this government, the Alstom plant wouldn't even exist as of today. 
We invested, we invested over $171 million for refurbished 94 Go Rail coaches. In May, we made $180 million investment for new streetcars for the, T for the TTC. According to a leaked document obtained by the NDP, the Ontario government planned to sneak the lower Canadian content minimum into a request for proposal for major transportation projects in the GTA. Why on earth, why on earth would this Premier do that without telling anyone, without consulting anyone, Speaker? Why would he put thousands of good-paying Ontario jobs on the line? Thunder Bay Mayor Bill Morrow was part of the 2008 Ontario Liberal government that put the 25% policy into effect, a percentage at the time he attempted to make even higher. Morrow stressed he cannot confirm whether the NDP accusations are true, but explained what a change like this would mean for the Alstom plant. If it goes down to 10%, clearly um, it can have a very, very significant impact on the long-term viability of the plant. And so very concerning for what it might mean for future work um, here at the plant uh, in Thunder Bay. A request for comment to verify the truth behind the Ford government's slashing of Canadian content minimums were unanswered. Vasilio Spellos, TBT News. Okay, and an update to that, a government official has just gotten back to us since we've been on the air saying the 25% Canadian content rules remain in place for most transit projects, but insists in this specific case some components could not be sourced here in Canada. Two people are in hospital following a two-vehicle collision this morning on Highway 61 near the Thunder Bay Airport. OPP closed the roadway in both directions for nearly nine hours as officers investigated the cause of the crash. Kurt Black has the details. The incident occurred just after 7 in the morning. Officers from the OPP, along with Superior North EMS and Thunder Bay Fire and Rescue, responded to reports of a collision between two SUVs heading in opposite directions on Highway 61. While the investigation into the accident is still ongoing, OPP spokesperson Mike Golding Acknowledge that this time it appears it was the southbound vehicle that initially crossed the center line. Our investigation has led us to believe uh, appears to have lost control and slid into the uh, oncoming northbound lane, striking another motor vehicle. Um, the driver of the southbound vehicle had to be extricated from the vehicle uh, and was taken to hospital with what was described as uh, serious life-threatening injuries. The second driver involved suffered minor injuries from the crash and were also taken to hospital for further evaluation. Investigators on scene have yet to determine what exactly caused the SUV to lose control, but Golding is confident that they should have an answer shortly. Uh, I know the understanding is the vehicle entered the other lane. I'm not exactly sure what the cause was for that, but uh, like I said, we have our, our TTCIs, our technical traffic collision investigators at the scene. They'll determine that for us. The roadway was reopened to traffic just before 5 o'clock. Kurt Black, TBT News. Many parents and guardians were left to find their own way to get kids to school today. Student transportation services cancelled all morning buses due to the extreme cold temperatures, which bottomed out at minus 35 around 8 a.m. with a wind chill of minus 44. The city also cancelled crossing guard service this morning. The buses did run this afternoon, and crossing guards were back on the job at that time as well after temperatures improved. A family in Oliver Papoonj managed to escape without injury following an early morning fire. The family and their pets were then aided by a passerby who offered his truck as shelter from the record-setting cold temperatures. The fire consumed the home's carport and had extended to the house itself when the Oliver Papoonj Fire Department arrived on scene around 4.30 this morning. Fire Chief Sean Horan says crews were able to limit extensive fire damage to the carport and the back of the home, although there's, there was smoke and water damage throughout most of the building. Well, given that we were dealing with minus 35 to minus 40 temperatures, it was very challenging. Um, but we were able to, to hit the, the house, knock it down, and, and, uh, and um, contain it to a couple rooms in the house. The investigation is still in its early stages and the cause of the fire and full extent of the damage have yet to be confirmed. A GoFundMe page has since been set up to support the family.
Today marked the end of an era for the town of Dryden as officers with the Dryden Police Service clocked out for the last time. Last year, Council made the decision to transition from the municipally run service to the Ontario Provincial Police. The last radio call was made at 6 a.m. local time before officers began the process of decommissioning their equipment and headquarters in order for the OPP officers to take over policing efforts in the community. A small ceremony was later held at the centre just for officers, retired members and their families, but that didn't stop fellow first responders in the area from providing a lights and siren parade while students from nearby Open Road School gave the officers an honour guard send-off. We'll have the full report on the handoff on tomorrow's news hour. Three males from the GTA, including a 16-year-old, have been arrested after Thunder Bay police were alerted to a home takeover on the city's north side. Officers were dispatched to a home on the 0 to 100 block of Regent Street yesterday evening. The three accused were found in a washroom and resisted officers' attempt to enter. They were eventually taken into custody and police seized cocaine and cash. The accused are charged with trafficking and other offences. Thunder Bay Mayor Bill Morrow says he won't be running for the Liberal Party in the June provincial election and will instead seek a second term as mayor in the fall. Morrow says it was a tough call, but he's focused strictly on the city rather than reclaiming the Thunder Bay Atacokan seat at Queen's Park. Before being elected mayor in 2018, Morrow spent 13 years in provincial government. Both the provincial and municipal elections will be held later this year. Morrow only recently decided to forego another provincial run and focus his efforts on being re-elected as mayor in the fall. He says the decision wasn't made lightly. What was extremely difficult, I, um, I don't mind saying I thought about it for a significant period of time. Uh, I enjoyed my time tremendously in the 15 years that I was there. Felt very fortunate to be in government for 15 years and to be able to move forward a lot of significant files for the city of Thunder Bay. And so it was not easy for me to decide not to do it, but at this point, um, that's the decision that I've made. Liberal Riding Association officials say they've met with other potential candidates and hope to announce their candidate in the near future. At Queen's Park today, there's a new legislation aimed at protecting employees in the province. The goal is to let workers know if they're being electronically monitored by their employer. Colin DeMello explains. The Ford government has been working to overhaul the rights of employees in Ontario. And today, any worker who worries that their company might be tracking and monitoring what they do on company time is now getting a new piece of legislation. As millions of Ontarians worked from home during the pandemic, there have been questions about how closely their companies are watching. And today, the Ford government says it will pass new legislation to pull back the curtain. So I think, you know, about those moms and dads that... Uh, we're taking Zoom calls from their bedroom or their kids' bedrooms, and they weren't being told if, you know, they were being recorded, whether it was through audio uh, or video. Ontario's Labour Minister says any company with more than 25 employees would need to have a written contract that spells out how company computers, cell phones, GPS systems, and other electronic devices are being tracked. Privacy uh, is important to themselves uh, and to their families. And government has to step up and uh, ensure that businesses are uh, doing this and, and properly, uh, you know, using technology. But the province's legislation would not be able to help thousands of employees who work for federally regulated companies. This is probably something that happens more in larger companies. I don't think there are a ton of small businesses that are uh, actively monitoring. There may be some that, you know, if you have a company cell phone, the cell phone has the capability to monitor. Um, but I'm not sure that there are a lot of small businesses that are doing anything with that data or are likely even aware um, that that's something that they may have access to. The government also had few details about how the legislation would be enforced and how the penalties would be associated. Questions that are top of mind for businesses. The devil is going to be in the details of this one. What is it business owners are going to need to spell out? What are they going to have to do? What does any sort of complaints process look like? Are there fines involved? Still a lot of questions coming off of this announcement. The Minister of Labour says once the legislation is passed, employers will be given six months to implement the new policies and they will be given new guidelines and regulations from the Ontario government on exactly what those policies should look like. At Queen's Park, Colin DeMello, CTV News.
Turning to COVID-19 now, the number of infected patients at the Regional Health Sciences Center continues to hold relatively steady, but the number of ICU patients has declined since yesterday. There are now 40 COVID patients there, up from 39, with eight in intensive care. That's down from 11 in the ICU on Wednesday. Overall hospital occupancy has risen to nearly 107 percent, while ICU occupancy continues to hold at 86 percent. Big Brother Canada has announced its newest cohort of contestants, and a Thunder Bay woman is among them. 24-year-old J.C. Lynn Graham has been named to Season 10 of the hit reality TV series, looking to win the $100,000 grand prize. My strategy to win Big Brother Canada is to go in the house, play both sides, use my social game to really manipulate people, charm people, and reel them in a little. Um, I'd like to create a Final Four alliance with those that I trust most. The social media manager has been a die-hard fan of the franchise for most of her life, prior to the Canadian version first airing. Graham becomes the third Thunder Bay resident to be on the series, though it's not her first time she's thrown her hat in at the ring. Four years ago, she just missed the final cut. Her mother, Chantel, says she will, it'll be tough to watch her daughter on TV without being able to warn her about any of the other contestants, but she believes the audience will absolutely adore her. Anybody who knows J.C. Lynn knows that she's got some entertainment value for sure. Um, if you would have seen some of the spots they're calling, they're dubbing her the cutthroat cutie. So she has that cute, innocent look and, and you know, her approachability and just kind of the way she acts. But then you cross her and you get a completely different person. So I think they're looking at that entertainment value. Viewers can tune in to Global Thunder Bay next Wednesday at 8 o'clock to catch Graham on the Big Brother's 10th season debut. Well, and good luck. To